This is going to be Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to look at what is the future for the saints. If you look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1, it says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven, saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. So the future for the saint involves, number one, praise. When we see Jesus Christ, we won't cease to give him praise. Notice the words, Alleluia, salvation, glory, honor, and power. All these are directed towards the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is finally going to get to the praise that he deserves from millions of his saints. And in verse 2, they call him true and righteous, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He is righteous. And the only reason we get to go to heaven is because of him and his imputed righteousness that we get at salvation. In verse 3, they say, Alleluia again. And this means praise the Lord. In verse 4, they fall down and worship before him. Notice they never fall on their back like they do at the Benny Hinn meetings. The people in the Bible fall forward on their face when they worship jesus christ and in verse 5 a voice says praise god all ye his servants in verse 6 they proclaim the lord god omnipotent reigneth and this means he is all powerful he's omnipotent they praise his strength and are thankful they are servants to a god who can do anything and there is no need to fear when you're on the lord's side then in verse 7, they say, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. And this shows people are happy and have found happiness, giving praise to God and not to self. So number one, the future of every saint involves praise. And this is without a big drum set, electric guitars, a big choir singing the same thing over and over again, like the contemporary crowd that could be directed to anybody. They just add Jesus' name in there when they could replace Jesus' name with he or she, and it would sound just like any other song on the radio. But number one, the future of the saint involves praise. Number two, and we'll go back to Revelation 19 too, the future of the saint involves payback. It says, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Notice the earth is corrupt, and this is how God described it during the days of Noah. The earth was corrupt before him, and the earth was full of violence. And during a time when fallen angels fornicated with the daughters of men in Genesis 6, this will most likely happen again during the time of Jacob's trouble, because as you know, Jesus said it will be as it were in the days of Noah. At the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is going to get vengeance on his enemies. He destroys the great whore. He kills the God-haters. He avenges the blood of his saints. And Revelation 6.10 talks about those saints praying to God. And they say, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So that's what Revelation 19.2 19, is talking about where it says, And hath avenged the blood of his servants at our hands. So there's going to be vengeance brought back on these people. The tribulation saints are going to be praying some imprecatory prayers, and they, they want the enemy destroyed for killing God's people. Isaiah 63, 3-4 says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain on my raiment for the day of vengeance is in mine heart and the year of my redeemed is come so you see the day of the Lord when Jesus Christ comes back it's a day of vengeance the blood is going to be thick the second coming will be the true definition of a bloodbath men love blood they shed innocent blood just like this great whore does, which is, which is one of the things the Lord hates. He hates hands that shed innocent blood, and now they will bleed. Romans twelve nineteen says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. For us today, if we have a problem with another person, remember not to get back at them. Let the Lord handle the problem. The vengeance is his. 
And sometimes God will let a person in our life to attack us because he is chastening us for sin. But then the Lord will then get vengeance on the person for attacking you, even though he allowed them to do it. To pass the test, be nice to that person and pray for them. But the future of every saint involves payback. And you're coming back with the Lord Jesus Christ on a white horse. So your future involves praise. It involves payback. And it also involves preparation. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. You got born again by believing in the gospel. Your sins are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Throughout the remainder of your life here, you are trying to live holy and righteous, not so you can stay saved or be kept saved, but because you love Jesus Christ and so that you can get rewards and not be disappointed when you get to the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11 talks about the judgment seat of Christ, and it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Notice the terror of the Lord. And we aren't going to be judged for sins or whether or not we are going to make it to heaven. That's already been settled. The sins have already been paid. You're going to be judged on your service. And it's going to be a fearful time. What are you doing for Jesus Christ? What are you doing with the right motive? Are you doing what you're doing for Jesus Christ with the right motive? Once we make it through the judgment seat of Christ, we are then ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's what it's talking about. His wife hath made herself ready in Revelation 19.7. And this marriage supper of the Lamb is for the Lord Jesus Christ and His bride. The Old Testament saints aren't in the bride. They are friends of the bridegroom, like John the Baptist. And the tribulation saints are friends of the bridegroom as well, who will be guests at the wedding. They are the wise virgins in Matthew 25. The church, which is the bride, is one chaste virgin. Singular. Different from the virgins in Matthew 25. Everything you do here is leading up to how you make it out at the judgment seat of Christ. And your future involves a marriage supper. But before that, you have to put on something nice for the bridegroom. So your future involves praise. It involves payback, preparation. And number four, it involves proper attire. Revelation 19.8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Your clothes will match your spiritual state. White as snow, your sins were as scarlet, now they are white as snow. You're righteous, your clothes will be clean and white. This shows that in heaven, God has it worked out to where your clothes can't get dirty. There will be no need for washing machines in heaven, and there will be no fashion contest in heaven. Sometimes women get mad at each other because they copied each other's outfit or because their clothes look better. Another woman's clothes look better. But every saint will get fine linen, clean and white. And the rich have nice clothes on earth. The rich man in Luke 16 was clothed in royal apparel. And maybe you don't have nice clothes. Maybe you wish you had better things. But when you meet Jesus Christ, you're going to have nice clothes. So your future involves praise, payback, preparation, proper attire, and number five, a perfect meal. Revelation 19, 9, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. I can't wait for the marriage feast. All the saints from every age will be together in one big place. Nobody griping or complaining about the food. Nobody is cussing out the waiter. After Sunday morning service and ruining their testimony, uh, nobody has to count calories and it is a perfect meal. You may think Olive Garden and Texas Roadhouse and Red Lobster are perfect meals, but you don't know where that food's been. These people probably don't even wash their hands before they make it. And every restaurant has rats and roaches. You don't have a perfect meal here on earth, but you will when you get to heaven. We will eat with Jesus Christ and not even have to worry about an upset stomach. We won't have to dispose of the food. Jesus Christ ate in his glorified body on earth, and we will eat on, in our glorified bodies one day just for the pleasure of it. 
Think about how exciting you're going to be knowing that you're in heaven and you can't get out and you don't want to get out and you know it will never have sorrow or crying anymore and you're not going to hunger or thirst anymore. You will eat just for the pleasure of eating like you do sometimes now on the you won't be committing gluttony and you won't get fat. And this is what you'll do all through the millennial kingdom, all through eternity. You're in a perfect state. You can't get unhappy. You can't sin. And you're with Jesus Christ. Your future also includes the path of the advent. As I said before, if you're saved, then you're coming along with Jesus Christ as he gets his payback. So your future not only holds praise, proper attire, a perfect meal, but also the path of the advent. Revelation 19.11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he thus doth judge and make war. Exodus 15.3 says the Lord is a man of war. 1 Samuel 17.33 calls Goliath a man of war from his youth. And he is a type of the Antichrist. And Psalms 55.21 talks about war being in the heart of the Antichrist. So these are men of war. But Jesus Christ is a God of war. He's not coming to bring peace but a sword. Imagine the fear of the world when heaven opens up and Jesus Christ comes down. Revelation 19.12 says, And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had, on his, he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. In one of Black Sabbath's songs, they talk about Satan approaching them with eyes of fire. And that is no surprise because Satan wants to be like Jesus Christ who has eyes as a flame of fire. He has many crowns on his head. Maybe it is the crowns tossed towards the, his feet at the throne in Revelation 4.10. And First Corinth, uh, 1 Chronicles 20 and verse 2 talks about David. And it says, And David took the crown of their king from off his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold. And there were precious stones in it, and it was set upon David's head. And he brought also exceeding much spoil out of the city. Just like David took a crown, Jesus Christ would take the crown from the God of this world, and began to rule this world himself. Revelation 19.12 says he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And who knows what this name is? It isn't the first time he had a name that was secret. In Judges 13.18 it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Just like in the stories like Rumpled Stiltskin, someone is trying to guess a name. There is no original plot outside of the Bible. Also notice that here Jesus Christ has many crowns and he is coming in for war. And this is the opposite of the Antichrist in Revelation 6 who does come in on a white horse but he has one crown and he comes in peaceably. Showing a difference between the white horse rider in Revelation 6 and Jesus Christ in Revelation 19. The one in Revelation 6 is a bowman while the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 19 has a sword. So it's two different horsemen. Revelation 19.13 says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is the seventh occurrence with the W in Word of God with a capital letter. And he is the Word of God. He is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and what a bloody day this will be. His name is called the Word of God. Once again, notice that capital W. Jesus is the living word, the Bible is the written word, and the closest thing we can physically see today when it comes to Jesus Christ is his word. The written word tells us who he is, why he came, and how he is coming back. And you see Jesus Christ as the word of God in the first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said... And there is your word of God where it says, and God said. That's God's words. When Jesus Christ was on earth, you could literally see the word, preach the word. Psalms 138 and verse 2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The word of God is important. We need every word of God. Revelation 19.14 says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And this is the bride coming back with Jesus Christ as an army. 
And that's us in our proper attire with Jesus Christ in the path of the advent. Jude one fourteen says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Deuteronomy 33.2, And he said, The Lord come from Mount from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand when a fiery law for them. So we're coming back with Jesus Christ. We're not going to be afraid. We're not going to be afraid of getting killed because we can't die. And Joel chapter 2 gives a good description of us as we come back with Jesus Christ. If you look at Joel chapter 2, verses 3 through 10, it says, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen. So shall they run, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. We're going to be riding white horses, maybe like those horses of fire that took Elijah up in a whirlwind. They may even talk like Balaam's ass. There's no telling what the horses, the power that they will have. But back to Revelation, in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15, it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Jesus Christ isn't going to be crucified this second time he comes back. He once suffered for sins, and now he is coming back with a vengeance. The sharp sword is the word of God, according to Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Psalms 149.6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and two-edged sword in their hand. If you want to be like Jesus Christ, then speak the words of God. He's going to have the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Jesus Christ is going to smite the nations with his sword. All the nations are going to be gathered together against him for war. He wants all of them in one place to knock them out at one time. And it's no new thing for people to gather together against Jesus Christ. Like Pilate and Herod. Like the Pharisees and Sadducees. The enemies of God get together together to be against Christians and against Jesus Christ. That's how much they hate him. Revelation 19.16 says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Any king you have, he is king over that king. He is king of LeBron James, who they refer to as King James. He is coming back to set up his kingdom that he will rule with a rod of iron. And he has so many names because an infinite amount of words couldn't describe the character of Jesus Christ. You have King, Lord, Savior, Master, the Word of God. The list goes on. Revelation 19.17 says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. And this is obviously referring to Matthew 24, 27, and 28, where it says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east... And shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. These, uh, there's a lot of people who are teaching that this is something that it's definitely not. They're saying that the carcass is the body of Christ, while the eagles are the angels gathering together the body of Christ. And they just butcher the verse by claiming that the carcass is somehow... The Christians are the body of Christ and the eagles are the angels gathering the saints. This is a cringe-worthy private interpreta interpretation. They spiritualize the verses that won't match their doctrine. And they want to make this the like a rapture because they're teaching a post-trib pre-wrath rapture. They don't believe that this is the second coming of Jesus Christ 
where he's coming back with a vengeance. They're more concerned with defending their beliefs than they are about what the book says. But the verse is obviously referring to exactly what it says. It says, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Matthew twenty four twenty seven and 28 describe what we just read in Revelation nineteen seventeen. When the Son of Man comes, where the carcass is, the dead bodies, that is where the eagles will be gathered together. And it has nothing to do with the body of Christ. And it obviously matches the supper of the great God in Revelation 19.17, where it says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Now, does that not match Matthew 24.28, or does it not? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with angels gathering us together. That doesn't make any sense. How could it be any more clear? They have to spiritualize or make it poetic in Matthew 24, 8 instead of just believing what it says because if they don't, it ruins their post-trib pre-wrath heresy. Revelation 19, 18 says that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men both free and bond, small and great. And notice the verse mentions those who are free and bond, another proof of slavery still going on in the last days. But none of the classes of people from this earth is excluded from being eaten by the fowls. Revelation 19 and verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So you have these guys who put together these battle simulators to see who would win in a battle. They will pit like 5,000 German soldiers against 60,000 Spartans just to see who would come out on top. And this is going to be like that except Jesus Christ will be against the armies of the earth and the Antichrist. And they're going to be threshed like Jesus Christ, like he's using a threshing machine. He threshes the heathen in his anger. And Jesus Christ by himself can wipe out all the armies on the earth. Millions and millions of soldiers and devils. The blood will flow to the horse's bridles and it will be completely lopsided. Just like the, the battle at the end of the millennium. Where Satan is destroyed, Satan and his army, as the sin of the sea, just gets one verse and they're destroyed. Revelation nineteen twenty says, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that had worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So the antichrist and the false prophet will both be cast into the lake of fire at this time. And maybe the armies that are gathered together will be trying to keep these two satanic beasts safe. But they will fail miserably. They deceive the world with miracles. And I would hate to go to the lake of fire after damning millions of souls to hell like they did through their deception. Revelation 19.21 says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The word of God is the sword. And he is the living word of God. Stop and realize that if you are saved, then you're going to be following the Lord Jesus Christ on the path of the advent as he tramples over the heathen in his anger. And you are going to be on the winning side with nothing to fear. Imagine being on the opposite end of this beating if you're not saved. And imagine seeing ten thousands of saints coming straight for you and in front of them is King of Kings and Lord of Lords whose eyes are like a flame of fire. You don't want to be on the receiving end of that type of beating. It's going to be completely lopsided. He's going to, going to completely trample everyone in his anger. But if you don't want to be in that situation, you need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Realize you're a guilty sinner and that you can't save yourself. And believe on Him and what He did on the cross for you to be your payment for sin. Jesus Christ died he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He died for your sins and he's, he died by shedding his blood. Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And you are a sinner. 
don't have any doubts about it. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you don't get those sins under the blood, then you're going to go to an eternal hell, just like the rich man in Luke 16 who lifted up his eyes being in torments. And then one day you're going to be called up to the great white throne judgment, and Jesus Christ is going to say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then... That's where you're going to face the second death. The Bible says in Revelation, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And you don't want that to be your future. You want your future to be all the things that I mentioned in this study. You want it to be praise. You want it to be payback. You don't want to be on the receiving end of the payback. But this has been Revelation chapter 19.